there. Okay, it says it's streaming on Facebook. Mm -hmm. So, hey. good morning. It's so great to see all of you today. It's it's really amazing to be here together today and think that we just lost CT Vivian and John Lewis. Dorothy, did oh, you think? Yeah, Reverend, Reverend Vivian uh, passed on first um, yesterday morning. Well, the news mm -hmm. first. And wow, I did not hear that. Well, how did yeah. I miss that? Yeah. Wow. Hmm. Quite, quite a day in American history. Quite mm -hmm. the giants everyone's standing upon the shoulders of. Did you know them, Dorothy? Well, I mean, I knew them as well as I guess anybody else knew them in terms of I knew their I knew their history um, at the Freedom Rights Museum. We are constantly calling their names and talking about them as we interpret the history of the Freedom Rides. So yes. I, I met John Lewis on a number of occasions, um, Congressman Lewis. Um, I posted a picture on our page. Um, I attended the uh, John Lewis Day event down in Troy um, a couple of years ago. And I think that was really the last time I had an opportunity to see him up close and personal. Wow. And um, I have a picture of me and him at that event. Um, and um, I had met, the last time I saw Reverend Vivian was at Alabama State University. The National Center had a, uh -huh. a 50th anniversary in, uh, of the Southern Montgomery March in 2015. So he spoke there. So I, I, I knew them just on and tangentially, like a lot of us did, but I think we all felt like we knew them that they that they were they were a part of who we all all are as Americans. So absolutely, and I last saw Congressman excuse me Congressman Lewis at the grand opening for the Equal Justice Initiative mm -hmm. Museums, and his words were so powerful. And you know they had that piped in video of, of President Obama. Um, that everybody was so excited about. But then they invited him to the stage who had led so many of the events that we're going to talk about today and just sacrificed so much. And it's, it's a moment in my life I'll certainly never forget. Very cool. They were... Um... Well, this reminds me of... Uh... John Adams and Thomas Jefferson died on the same day. I was thinking that too. Yeah, that's that's that weird. Uh, and and I was looking on my phone. It says that uh, they died. They both died. Today is Nelson Mandela's birthday. Oh, is it? Well, happy birthday, Nelson Mandela. That, uh, John Lewis came by the museum a couple of times while I was there. Amazing to hear him walk through the actual permanent exhibition and go through everything. Really, really cool. Really amazing and just. Yeah, I, I met them both at ASU. Um, and John Lewis has always been just incredible his life story and the stuff he went through and of course him being an Alabama native I always felt really um, some kind of resonance with him he's just an amazing guy amazing absolutely as you say so much pride for us to know that he, he's part of our state and to have changed our country the way he did as Dorothy was talking about it's, it's just wonderful Mm -hmm. uh, I think. Yeah, the man took several beatings too, buddy. They're beating on on the Edmund Pettus Bridge and then beating on the bus, the Freedom Run. It's like yes. wow. Yes, and I mean that, he during never the fought ends. back. During the city. Yeah. yeah, he never fought back. That's the thing. It's like I might have been <laughs> tempted to start striking out at somebody myself. That's amazing. I absolutely. To think about that kind of civil disobedience, that kind of nonviolent protest where you have your skull cracked and you remain peaceful mm. and, and resolute, it's, it's truly heroism that 
an ordinary person is capable of, but not many of us can relate to. Right. I always, um, when I was a kid, I was, you know, Martin Luther King, I was more of a Malcolm X kind of guy, you know? Yeah. But as I got older and realized the kind of courage it took to be nonviolent, I was like, whoa, that's that's amazing. I um and meeting Reverend Gratz did a lot for me in that regard. Such a peaceful man, calm. It 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 just really makes you I, I came to admire that nonviolent stance so much more as I got older. Well, and Reverend Gratz got to come to the museum around the 50th anniversary of the march when we were having some programming and, and that was very powerful and um and, and i i remember that malcolm x came down to selma before um the voting rights march but i think it's time for us to get started good morning everyone i'm alice novak from the montgomery museum of fine arts and i'd like to welcome the artist bill ford and Madeline Burkhart from the Rosa Parks Museum and Dorothy Walker from the Freedom Rides Museum. We are so happy to be with you today and thank you for joining us as we think about art of the civil rights movement in Montgomery. And we would like to dedicate this program to John Lewis and C.T. Vivian, who as Bill was just pointing out, died on the same day like Thomas Jefferson and John Adams. And I went in my bookshelves and I found this book, March. Um, actually, John Lewis did create art about the civil rights movement himself. Um, Dorothy, I know you, you guys sell this. Um, in Madeline, all three, all three of the March series. So yeah. you can go downtown and, and find these at uh, their museums. And so it is a graphic novel about his experience and his contribution to the art of the civil rights movement in Alabama. Um, so would you guys have anything else you'd like to add before we go ahead and look at our images? I'd like to add, Alice, that you brought up about the March uh, graphic novels. I, a lot of people don't know that those were actually, uh, Congressman Lewis's graphic novels are based on an original graphic novel that was done by the Fellowship of Reconciliation in 1956. Um, I'm sorry, I don't have a picture of it um, in front of me to show you, but we do have copies at the museum. And that's where he got his inspiration, actually. Wow. Um, from, the, from the original uh, pamphlet, um, graphic novel, which is not nearly as extensive as Congressman Lewis's, but it is very informative about what happened during the bus boycott and the nonviolent training. And it's, it's really interesting and um, really kid friendly. So. So we can see that at the Freedom Rides Museum too. You can pick Fantastic. up a copy as a matter of fact. Fantastic. Okay, <clears throat> so I am going to try to share our screen and let's see. Madeline, um, will you tell us a little bit about um, the history of the bus boycott as we introduce the art of Rosa Parks? Sure. Um, so everyone, I think, I'm going to kind of assume that a lot of people are familiar with the name Rosa Parks and at least the fact that she was arrested for refusing to give up her seat. Um, so on December 1st, 1955, uh, when she was coming home from work, uh, she boarded a bus with a bus driver, James Blake, who she had already had some issues with in the past. And she, seated, she sat in an area where she was allowed to sit. And once more passengers started getting on the bus and only about maybe like a block and a half, two blocks down the road, um, James Blake ordered her to move. And she said no. And from there on, um, you know, the rest is history. So at the museum, we're located at the site of Rosa Parks' arrest. Um, she was not the first woman to be arrested. Um, I do feel like we should point that out four and there are other women as well who built the whole Browder versus Bill that was the one that helped in the bus segregation in Montgomery, Alabama. And so the bus boycott lasted for 382 days, uh, which is really, really crazy. And when we have our fourth grade students who come through, it's hard for them to realize like how long that is because 
you know, you're walking to work, you're trying to carpool and all these different things. And you've got the police who are out to arrest you for, you know, just protesting basically. Um, and so for 382 days, so many men and women, about I believe 90% of Montgomery's black population participated in the boycott. Mm -hmm. And it helped I mean, make it a, a success. And a lot of protests and boycotts So we have this um, case, Browder versus Gale, that ultimately uh, ends to the legal uh, right of, of bus drivers to act prejudice. And then, um, as you said, this incredible organization that led up to it with a dynamic leader, but so many people that had been ready um, to enact this plan and this incredible participation about ordinary people again who, who, who changed the world. So Madeline, I know you have two images of Ms. Parks that you've shared with us. Tell us a little bit about how these artists have interpreted her character and this moment in history and how people interact with them at your museum. Sure. Um, so when you first walk in the museum, you're greeted by this bust by the artist, artist Lane. Um, and there's also a massive 12 foot triptych behind the bust um, that goes through Rosa Parks's life journey. And so it goes from, you can kind of see one image behind the bust head, which is a little bit of a younger Rosa Parks. It's from the boycott. But then um, if you were to kind of zoom out if we could from the photo, you would see so many other images from her life. And I think artist Lane wanted to show that quiet strength that Rosa Parks was known for. Um, in this bust, it is very serene almost. Like she's very, she just looks at peace, but also very firm and unmoving. And this is the image that again, greets you when you come in the museum and a lot of people have their photo made in front of this bust, maybe more so um, than the other work that we're gonna show you. But Artist Lane was actually a black Canadian artist who created this. And she also created Sojourner Truth's bust, which is in the US Capitol building. So she really likes to focus on these women who made such incredible strides towards equality and justice and everything. Um, but yeah, both of our statues that we have are bronze and they just really allow people to kind of take Rosa Parks off of that pedestal a little bit and humanize her a little bit because this is a very human-like portrait. I mean, she was, you know, that's the whole thing about the Montgomery Bus Boycott is these were just everyday people who came together to do something big and change the world. And I think that our artwork, especially this bust really portrays that. And in the leadership of women being so important, uh, not only in this act um, of civil disobedience and protest, but also in organizing the, the boycott. And Madeline, was she around late 30s? 40s. Um, okay. Yeah, she was born in 1913. And then you mentioned you have this statue also. We do, and there are duplicates of that one around um, the artist. He created this one for us. And then there's also one in Lafayette, Louisiana and in Dallas at their transportation center, I think that's what it's called. And um, again, both of them are in bronze. This is the one where we had the most interaction because the artist's intention with this particular piece was for people to sit next to Rosa Parks and kind of have the feeling that they were on the bus beside her. And this image of her is taken from the famous photograph that was staged after she refused to give up her seat um, because we don't have any images from December 1st, 1955. And so if you do look at that famous black and white photo of her sitting on the bus, looking out the window, this is kind of the same jacket and uh, handbag and hairstyle that she's wearing in the photo. Um, but yeah, this one is the one that people really, really gravitate towards, even the people who don't necessarily want their photo maybe in front of the bus because it looks too staged. They just feel just 
more it's more familiar to them to sit down with her kind of forth it and be able to join her on that bus mm -hmm. uh, and both of these are bronze they are they're both bronze um and eric he will come every um every so often to do some repairs and restoration on this one because so many people are sitting on it it tarnishes it after a while and, and both artists have chosen this very classical and permanent medium uh, to to capture this this moment in history and and this this woman that as you said almost everyone who lives in Montgomery or comes to Montgomery has heard of um, and I know Dorothy told me that even when people arrive at the Freedom Riders Museum um, they first recognize Rosa Parks before learning really more about a completely different story on a bus. But we'll get to that in a minute. Madeline, you had a couple of recommendations that you wanted to make um, in relation to your museum. Sure, um, so the book I would like to recommend is The Rebellious Life of Mrs. Rosa Parks. It is a very extensive biography, um, but I was talking a little bit earlier about her quiet strength. Um, a lot of people who come through the museum and who just think of Rosa Parks, they only associate her with the bus boycott and that's kind of it and that's not true she had a very lengthy life of activism and she was passionate you can see where this first starts with her all the way into later in life and i think it does a really really great job of kind of breaking down who she was as mm -hmm. a person and giving her you know, more depth than just like the quiet street character that she's portrayed as everywhere. Um, mm. So definitely that book. And then the exhibition that we have right now is called Down Yonder. I heard somebody calling my name by Masood Olufani. He's based out of Atlanta. And it is where, it's in our temporary art exhibition. And in this area, we try to make the museum a little bit more relevant because when you end in our permanent exhibition, you're ending kind of in 1956. And there's a little bit uh, with Bill Clinton giving um, Rosa Parks an award, but then you leave. And this temporary art exhibit is dealing with uh, police brutality. It deals with um, other images kind of just on the plight of the black community. And it's very, very, very moving and it's always free, uh, but it's up until October 17th. And I can't recommend coming down to see that enough because I think it kind of gives the whole best boycott more context to in the whole movement of what we're gonna talk about today. Well, incredibly timely and, and incredibly timely with all of the peaceful protests we've had in Montgomery recently as, as part of the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, so I hope we all get to come down and see that. Now on to Freedom Rides Museum. Dorothy, what, you have the actual uh, terminal where they arrived in, in 1961. Tell, tell us a little bit about the history. That's right, um, Alice. Um, what people are seeing right now on the screen is the um, front of what was Montgomery's uh, Greyhound bus station from 1951 up until 1996. It really hasn't been that long ago that this was the active Greyhound bus station in Montgomery. And of course, um, in 1951, when the bus station was built, um, it was built as a segregated facility. Um, and um, we do have um, um, features um, on the front of the building and inside the building that are reminiscent of its uh, segregated past. Mm -hmm. um, the, the tiled up uh, concrete entrance um, off to the, on the left of the screen is what was originally the entrance for black passengers called the colored entrance um, during the time of segregation. And there's, there's so much more history there about how the, the inequality of how this building operated for the first uh, 17 years it was in existence. Um, um, the Freedom Rights Museum is a historic site of the Alabama Historical Commission. We are the State Historic Preservation Office. And the, um, we, the Historical Commission got involved with this project um, in 1996 when Greyhound moved out of this facility to build another facility outside of downtown. 
Um, and actually this building became threatened by the development of the extension of the courthouse behind mm -hmm. us. And so the Historical Commission, along with others in the community, um, Mrs. Johnny Carr, who was the head of the MIA at the time, the Montgomery Improvement Association, and other really prominent voices in the community stepped forward to try to save the facility. And we were, we were very fortunate we were able to save part of this historic place um, where um, the Freedom Riders, um, the, the student Riders, college students, um, Congressman John Lewis, as we remember him today, um, he and 20 other students from Nashville um, came to this facility in 1961. Um, the Freedom Rides did not start in Montgomery. It did not start um, with the students in Nashville. It started in Washington, D.C. on May 4, um, 1961, and the goal was to go from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans, Louisiana, but coming through all of the Deep South states. And the purpose of the Freedom Rides um, was to challenge segregation that was occurring in interstate travel. Um, and I want to make sure that viewers know that it was, they were challenging segregation throughout interstate travel. The bus stations were the most visible form. They were the most popular form of transportation at that time. The bus stations then were the airports of today. And so obviously that was as the most visible form of transportation, that is what most people associate the Freedom Rides with. But the goal was not just to challenge the segregation that was happening in interstate uh, on interstate buses like Greyhound and Trailways, but also in trains and train um, stations and airports and airport terminals. The, all of those forms of all of those forms of transportation were segregated during the during this time. And so, um, like Mrs. Parks, um, there is a there's a young there's a, a, a young lady who is associated with the history of the Freedom Rise, Irene Morgan, which a lot of people don't know her name. Mm -hmm but she um, refused to give up her seat on a Greyhound bus in Virginia in 1944, prompting a, a Supreme Court case, Morgan versus Virginia, um, where the Supreme Court actually outlawed segregation in interstate travel um, 11 years uh, before um, they ruled on the case, um, the Montgomery bus boycott case. Um, and so as, as Madeline said, you know, and, and Irene, Ms. Irene Morgan was not the first either to refuse. Mm -hmm. Percy. Um, and so, um, but that, that Supreme Court case was sort of the foundational case for the Freedom Rides. And then in 1958, we have a young man from Selma, Alabama, uh, Bruce Boynton, who's now attorney Bruce Boynton, um, who, whose mother, um, Amelia Boynton, was very um, instrumental in the civil rights movement. He was a college student at Howard, and he was headed home to Selma, and he's arrested for refusing to give up, I mean, for, for trying to be served at the white lunch counter in the terminal in Virginia. So, um, the court cases um, where the Supreme Court had outlawed segregation and interstate travel, the free riders decide, um, the Congress of Racial Equality Corps decides they're going to challenge this segregation by putting interracial groups of people, um, not primarily young people in the beginning. Um, when they leave D.C., it's a mixed group from 18, the age range from 18 all the way to 61. And of course, Congressman John Lewis was one of the original 13 Freedom Riders. He was one of last, one of only three of the last of uh, the original thirteen that was still left um, with us. And as they, they don't, we they don't get a lot of resistance until they hit Alabama. And um, one bus is firebombed in Anderson, and, and another group of Freedom Riders on the trail with buses attacked in Birmingham. So the the ride is ended because of state and federal pressure on the riders to discontinue the ride. They get flown onto New Orleans. And then the students from Nashville come to pick up the journey. And they are the ones who arrive here in Montgomery under, um, they've been given assurances by federal and state officials that they're going to have police protection. But here there is a mob that meets them, hundreds of people with baseball bats and chains and pipes and bricks. And Congressman John Lewis, one of the things he's hit over the head with is a Coca-Cola crate. And we actually have a replica of that Coca-Cola crate at the museum that visitors can see. Um, uh, but they survived and they head on into Mississippi after lots of negotiations with Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and other civil rights leaders, they head into Mississippi where they spend time in Parchment Penitentiary, many of them for um, the charge of breach of peace. And so because of their willingness, over 329 free riders are arrested in Mississippi during the summer of 61. And because of their willingness to sacrifice and suffer, um, the, the federal uh, officials get involved in outlawing and making sure and enforcing not just outlawing, because the Supreme Court had already outlawed, but enforcing um, the desegregation of uh, particularly interstate buses, but then later trains and airplanes. 
So we, we owe a great deal of gratitude to our ability to freely travel to the Freedom Riders. And it's a story that are not, not a lot of people come to Montgomery knowing about. So they come here knowing about Rosa Parks, but they leave knowing about the Freedom Riders. Most of them do, almost all of them do. And so we're thankful because the uh, Rosa Parks Museum, our, our partners and our friends there um, do a great job of um, connecting people to this story as well as, as we all do in supporting each other. Um, so, um, so here at the terminal, at the, what was the original uh, Greyhound terminal, we are telling the stories of the Freedom Riders every day. People can come down. We have exhibits on the exterior of the building, but we also have powerful photographs in our inside the museum that speak to the significance of this history. Well, I know today you have a special work of art you want to share with us. Um, will you tell us a little bit about how the quilt came to be commissioned? Here's a picture of the artist in front of a, another one of her works. That's right. Ms. Nora Ezell, who um, grew, grew up in the Black Belt of Alabama, um, was um, living in the um, West Alabama, Tuscaloosa area, Utah, Alabama. And Ms. Ezell was known for what, um, the, the quilt behind her in this image is a very traditional uh, quilt. Um, what a lot of people are used to seeing when they see um, quilts made um, um, by Southerners. Um, this is a very traditional pattern, but Ms. Ezell's quilts um, went beyond the traditional pattern. She did the, the traditional pattern quilting, but she also did um, what we call um, story narrative quilts. Um, mm -hmm was very well known for these story narrative quilts. And when, when you pop up the image of the quilt that we have at the Freedom Rise Museum, people will see what I mean by story narrative. Ms. Yeah. Um, Ezell, um, back when the Alabama Historical Commission and the Montgomery Improvement Association were working to try to save the bus station, um, there was a local couple in Montgomery, um, Dr. and Mrs. Weinrib, who wanted to do something to support the efforts to, 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 of the museum coming to be. And they commissioned um, through the Montgomery Improvement Association, um, Miss Ezell to do a quilt um, in for the museum. And um, we are just so thankful that they reached out to this wonderful Alabama artist to um, lend her work and her talent to uh, memorializing um, the Freedom Riders, but the Freedom Rides, but also the historic the um, the Civil Rights Movement. It wasn't just the Freedom Rides. And so when people see this quilt. It is larger than life in the museum. We have it behind a glass encasement because it is such a, it's textile. So it, we definitely try to keep it um, as, as controlled and possible in terms of the environment. Um, but when, and, and the image of it doesn't do it justice. You really have to see it because it is three-dimensional. She sewed all kinds of um, things. There's pipe cleaners and, um, there's just, there's this incredible book in the middle that flips pages. Um, and so, and all of this is all hand stitched. It took her three months, two weeks and a few days. And the reason we know that is because she kept a journal while she was working on this quilt. And it's an amazing piece of art. Um, it features scenes, not just from the Freedom Rise, which is the very first one up in the upper left-hand corner mm -hmm. of the burning bus, the bus that was firebombed in Aniston. Alabama, but also you see scenes of Dr. King and, and the Birmingham jail, the, the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham where the four little girls um, died from the bombing. Um, the car um, and that was brought up from the river um, in Mississippi, but the three young men that were killed during um, trying to help register black people to vote, um, Sharna Cheney and Goodman, and then the gravesite of Jimmy Lee Jackson whose death was the motivation for the Selma's Montgomery March um, in 1965. Um, and then Holt Street Baptist Church, which was the first church in Montgomery um, where the, the first mass meeting for the bus boycott was held. Um, and then Judge Frank Johnson, who, whose federal rulings on civil rights really changed the landscape of American history. Um, so it's just so much packed into this. I, we love talking about the quilt and you really just have to see it to really appreciate all the hand stitching that takes place on it. Absolutely. I, I think we could talk about it all day. And, and we were thinking about bronze as, as the medium of the Rosa Park statues. And here we have a medium that was handed down um, from women in families to each other, that it, where your family became your art school and, and you learned to quilt and to use what we have around us to make a work of art. Um, and, and it is such a wonderful 
testimony with these different squares representing moments in 1961, 1964, 1955, all, all of this time, 1965, that we've been talking about, and um, how do visitors, young visitors like these, relate when they come in and see this incredible quilt? They are just in awe of it. You can see even the youngest of visitors um, gravitate to the his, to the the images that are on this quilt. They they want to know what these things are. What does it mean? Um, why why what are the, what is the imagery? And and the imagery speaks to all kinds all of the 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 moments of the movement. Mm. It speaks to a, a lot of the scenes that she portrays on this quilt are about the conflict and confrontation of the movement. Um, but when you go down to Holt Street Baptist Church and, and you see that image. I think she really put that in there because she she could have put the bridge. She could have right. and Pettis Bridge is the ultimate scene of conflict and confrontation during the movement. But she chose to put the church, and I think she wanted us to always remember that in that church, that's where Dr. King became the civil rights leader that he became. Right, was that moment. Um, so she also wanted us to remember the hope too. I think of the movement. Absolutely, and um, hope. I, I know we're going to get back to um, your recommendations in a minute with, with John Lewis, and, and we have one more image to look at, but um, I feel like he very much expressed hope at this moment in American history and seeing the widespread um, and very diverse protests that we have seen uh, and, and always kept hope as did every single person who participated in any of these acts, or as Bill said, one just wouldn't have been able to. So what 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 have you what are you recommending for us, Dorothy? So I'm recommending that everyone that in all of our friends, our family, every our colleagues go online and find a way to watch the most recent documentary about Congressman John Lewis that just came out on July 3rd. Um, produced by Magnolia Pictures and directed by the talented Don Porter, um, who does such a great job in stitching together. Um, it's a powerful uh, portrayal of Congressman Lewis's over six decades of his efforts to um, toward working toward equality and freedom and justice. And you can see, you know, he talks in the video about 45, you know, there's, he, he was arrested 45 times, but several of those times since he's been in Congress. Um, and just an incredible well-lived life, a, a credible life of commitment and sacrifice. As Bill said earlier, he continuously kept, no matter what the odds were, no matter what the obstacles, he continuously was involved because he said it was just so important. And I hope people understand today um, um, as we mourn his passing and celebrate his life and legacy, the, the urgency of the moment for all of us that we all have a role. We all, he was an ordinary person just like all of us, but he chose to live an extraordinary life of service and commitment um, and sacrifice. And I think if we give any portion of that um, to, to our, to our, to the, to the to humanity, I think we will do his life justice. Hmm. Go online, look for Good Trouble. That's the name of the documentary. And go out and make our own good trouble, right? That's right, get in good trouble. So now we have the distinct pleasure of getting to hear from an artist. And Bill, you were commissioned to do this mural on the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March. Would you like to remind us a little bit about the history of the Selma to Montgomery March? Well, you know, as I've been listening to the uh, other participants, I, I'm sitting here going, you know, I, I, I sometimes, forget that I was alive and conscious of all this stuff when it was happening. Uh, it, it's remarkable and it became remarkable to me as I got older. Uh, ironically, my good friend, Dr. Howard Robinson, who did his, his doctoral thesis on the civil rights movement in Montgomery, he and I became friends when we both worked at WSFA and while he was doing his research, he would call somebody's name and I go, oh yeah, I know her. Oh yeah, I, I know him. He was good <laughs> friends with my dad. He would look at me and go, what? You know, you know E.D. Nixon. And I went, yeah, I used to go, my dad used to go by after church 
we would go by Edie Nixon's house and uh, sit on the front porch while my father visited with him. I had on my church clothes and I frequently would be thinking to myself, I wish this old man would shut up and go home and pull off my shirt. You know, uh, even the Selma to Montgomery March, I was a student at, at um, St. Jude's. Yeah. And uh, to be in school and see that mass of humanity come over that bridge on Fairview with Martin Luther King in the lead, because they wouldn't let us out of school, even though the marches were camping on our, wow. on our, on our grounds. We had to stay in school. And I remember the nun said, I was in an English class, and she said, don't look out the window. So I'm sitting there like I'm looking at the front of the class with my eyes are cut to the side and I'm looking out the window. So I had a great vantage point. And uh, all those events growing up in Montgomery at that time, it, it's, it's odd in that uh, I was speaking to my great niece about this recently and she was asking about the civil rights movement and, and she was reacting with such you know, incredulity at how we were able to, how did you go about your everyday life while all this stuff was going on? And I, I told her, I said, well, we didn't think of it as being extraordinary, even though these things were happening. And I kind of likened it to her to, I said, it's like now, you guys are living in an era where you have drive-by shootings. Yet you, 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 you carry on your everyday activities. You know, you have drive-by shootings, you have gang violence, you have police, police brutality, and that's the way it was in the 50s and 60s. All the stuff was going on around us, but we still lived our ordinary life. You know, um, it, it was kind of a duality there. Um, so uh, even with the bus boycott, my, I, I was a little kid then, but I distinctly remember my first bus ride. And years later, it occurred to me, I, I never knew why my grandmother definitely wanted me to ride on the bus with her downtown because I had never been on a bus before. And I think it was another 15 or 20 years before I got on a bus again. But we boarded the bus right in front of my house. She let me put the coins in. And years later, I realized uh, when I was, went to vote for President Obama in the presidential election, and I saw all the grandmothers with their grandchildren in line waiting to vote. And I went, ah, that's what my grandmother was doing with me. Ah. She wanted me to be on that bus the first time it was possible for us to sit in the front of the bus. As a kid, I just remember watching the coins go down that little thing in the front, you know, when you put the, token, the money in and it was like a, almost like a pinball machine, the money went down. And, and uh, so <laughs> these events, you know, I, 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 I was either a little kid or preteen when most of this stuff was happening, like with the Selma to Montgomery March. I, I wasn't a teenager yet, but I was, I was old enough to be very aware of what was going on around me. And um, with my father being friends with E.D. Nixon and other people in the movement, my best friend, his father was... Um, Martin Luther King's best friend and the last deacon that he ordained at Dexter Avenue Church. And uh, so I was constantly in the peripheral of Martin Luther King showing up at their house. I distinctly remember after King won a Nobel Peace Prize, uh, my friend Ray Pierre and I were in his front yard playing, tossing a football ball around. And Ray Pierce said to me, he said, uh, uh, Reverend King spent the night at the house last night, yeah. he won the Nobel Peace Prize. And he wow. pointed out the uh, the um, US Marshals parked in the car down the street for protection at the end of our street, at either end of the street. And I remember being so jaded. And of course, he was kind of like he was bragging. I went, yeah, OK, throw the football. <laughs> it was like, OK, yeah, I'm over that. But uh, you know, years later, for me to be able to uh, to commemorate the bus boycott and the Selma to Montgomery March, I kind of felt like I had come full circle. Ironically, that that display on Rufus Lewis at the Rufus Lewis Library, 
I could probably throw a stone from my, if you look at this, uh, the library, the front of the library there, behind that library is Mobile Heights. And the house that I grew up in is probably 75 yards from the back of that library. Wow. So for me, it was all, it was all just kind of a, I feel like Sealy in some way, you know, that Woody Allen movie, <laughs> where you're around and all this history is going on around you. And uh, you're not quite a participant, but yet you're an observer. So for me now to, uh, you know, I, I, in some ways, uh, clearly I'm telling my age, <laughs> uh, it's just amazing to see the changes that have happened but at the same time, it's kind of disheartening to see that the work is not done yet. We still have a lot of work to do. Uh, but but I, I certainly was proud and, and, and really privileged to be able to, to do this. It was uh, the, my history with this, this display, I, I was actually um, asked to, to to can oversee the construction of a display for the murals that are on the south side uh, uh, by the library director, uh, Juanita Oz. Uh, John Fagan, the artist John Fagan, uh, who did the mural in the basement of the Dexter Avenue Church, oversaw that. And he also oversaw the construction of the display for the murals at Alabama State outside the National Center. He and my father, my father taught art in junior high and Mr. Fagan taught art in senior high and their classrooms butted against each other. They were at back Carver, there, right? At Carver. And, and so I grew up with John Fagan, kind of like my uncle. And um, so when Mr. Fagan, she contacted Mr. Fagan to, uh, to oversee the construction of the display at the Rufus Lewis Library, he referred her to me. He said, uh, Call, call Bill Ford. He'll take care of that. So, and of course, Mr. Fagan, whenever he asked me to do something, I go, yes, sir. Yes, sir. <laughs> so uh, I, I, I oversaw the construction of that. And, um, and the junior high school murals were done for the 25th anniversary, no, 35th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March. And um, they were displayed on the south side and that left the north side vacant. Hmm. And a couple of years later, uh, Juanita, doc, uh, Re Director O's asked me to, to, uh, to do something for the north side. So um, at the time, my original concept was to get a, a team of artists to, to, um, to work on the four panels individually, but the budget didn't quite, uh, allow that. So with my, with my experience uh, with digital art and graphics from my years of working at WSFA, I, I, I said this would be a way to, to be able to, uh, to get this done in a way that's cost effective because their budget was not, not particularly large. Mm. And I actually, because I had to have the pieces printed at a sign company, that basically ate up the budget for the piece. And I, I actually donated my work to the library because I thought like it was very important uh, that this, this uh, mural be seen. Mm. But, uh, but uh, Mrs. O's uh, came back later and with some, some help of some friends in the library, I did receive a stipend for that, which was really a bonus to me because I would have done it for free. Well, what a great gift. And as you said, you're just, this is all so close to home for you. I, I imagine you in school and St. Jude and there's Harry Belafonte and Joan Baez sleeping on the field behind your school. And um, I see a comment here from Michael Burdell, who I'm sure was there on the day your mural was unveiled. And he says, very impactful mural at the Rufus Lewis Branch Library. So let's look at the work of art itself a little bit and hear from you. Um, I, there are a few scenes of the bus boycott too, and we can quickly look at those and um, focus a little more on, on uh, the march. So here is the, the unveiling again, uh, there at the Rufus Lewis Branch Library. And here we have the full 
view of the panels and how they relate to each other. And then Bill, tell us a little bit about what's going on in your work. And in, in of course, in, in the first, uh, the first panel, uh, that image uh, was one taken uh, from a pho photograph that was contemporary right after the bus boycott ended. And of course, I, I, I really, one of the things that I remember so distinctly from those days, all men wore hats when they went out. It was, it was ubiquitous. A man did, a well-dressed man did not leave home without a hat. And Martin Luther King uh, was no exception. And I, I really like that image of him because it, it kind of kind of shows his um, his his overall involvement and his his stature as a man as a local Montgomery man. In those days, men were very um, well turned out when they went out. No, no well dressed men always wore a suit and a hat. And and again, Martin Luther King was no exception. And that quote uh, that I do democracy transform from thin paper to thick action is the greatest form of government on earth. And I, I like that quote from him because um, from thin paper to thick action, that, that kind of, Martin Luther King was always so eloquent. Mm. And, uh, and that quote to me, it typifies, frequently I'm, I'm kind of discouraged when I hear some people talk about America in disparaging tones. We're not perfect, but we are closer to it than most places on this earth. And I think the, the genius of our founding fathers was that the Declaration of Independence was a document that was more perfect than they were. Mm. Most of them were slave owners. A lot of them were slave owners. And for them to be able to codify and write down that, that to Thomas Jefferson, who, as we know, was probably most conflicted of them all, for him to, to be able to put that down and for them to ratify that and, and, and make it our founding do document. We're, we're constantly striving to be a more perfect union. And I think that's what we're seeing today. You know, there's a lot of turmoil in America right now, but I also think it's a sign of our growing pains and our, our constant struggle to be a more perfect union because we're not done yet. And only when everybody is valued for the intrinsic different. Everybody is different, but yet we're all the same. We're all human beings. And once we realize that just because somebody is different doesn't make them worse, actually it makes us stronger. And um, so I, I, I really, really am uh, hardened by what's going on in America today. And uh, that's that's the that's the genius of our, our founding fathers. So uh, I I don't I don't think we should throw the the baby out with the bath water. Well, and today we're really celebrating imagery of men and women and and the legacy of, of men and women who devoted their their lives to the principle that all men and women are, are created equal. Um, Absolutely. And you know that elegance of King that you were talking about and his, his style. I think about that so often, not him, but so many others walking those miles from Selma to Montgomery. We're still looking at the <laughs> we got here, but in those dress shoes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You must have heard, I think it was, uh, oh, was it, uh, uh, it might've been Cedric, the entertainer was talking about that. He said, Martin Luther King did all that marching in dress shoes. I would have had on some Nikes, you know, that, that's pretty funny. But uh, yeah, now this this particular panel, uh, again, uh, celebrates the bus boycott. And that central image in the color is Coretta. Yes. And I really, again, a native of Alabama who, who changed the world. And, and um, I, I definitely wanted to include her as well as the other women who were so important in, in, in the march and its vitality, aside from Rosa Parks being the, and any other women who were arrested, like uh, right. Mary Smith Ware uh, from here in Montgomery uh, that I know personally, and uh, she went to St. Jude's. I'll, I'll have to wow. it again. Uh, but, um, and then in the background, you see the, uh, the convoy, the, the carpool that was led by, um, by E.D. Nixon or organized by E.D. Nixon, my dad's friend there. But uh, 
but yeah, I, I, I definitely wanted to make sure and you see some schoolgirls in the back. And I, I, I often think about Montgomery and how incredibly together the black citizens of Montgomery were, uh, as Madeline said, you, you had 90% participation. Wow. I don't think we've done anything at the level of 90% since the bus boycott. And uh, it would be great if we could get those days back where everybody participates at that level. That would be fantastic. Absolutely. And at the same time, it's been amazing to see weekend after weekend, um, people down at the Capitol safely uh -huh. protesting. And um, I, I saw Cheyenne Webb Priceberg uh, down there at the event um, that um, Charles Lee organized and, and connecting back to somebody who walked across the bridge as, as a child uh, today was so cool. So what's going on in this image of the bridge crossing? In this image, uh, of course, you've got uh, Martin Luther King and Coretta and uh, C.T. Vivian and, and Fred Reese and, and, and that's John Lewis in the white, the white jacket uh, in the front. And uh, that, that, to me, I, I, years later in the next panel, you'll see when, when uh, Obama was, 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 was uh, celebrating the, the cross in there, I, somebody on Facebook uh, was looking at that image of the president and other people coming across the bridge and the comment was made, look at all those people and there's not an American flag anywhere in the picture as opposed to the first image where you saw a lot of the marches were carrying American flags. And I said, you know what? you got, if one thing that you don't see in the first image, you don't see any public officials. There are no public officials in this first image. No county commissioners, no mayors, no US congressmen. Those are regular ordinary citizens and ministers who are leading that march. But in this second march, you got the president of the United States. He represents the nation. We don't need no flags. <laughs> we, don't need no right. flags. we got the president. So what you what you should be crying is the lack of public officials in the first photograph, instead of looking at what's not in the latest photograph, right. think about what's not in the first one. Because in this particular image, that anniversary, you had senators and mayors and county commissioners and city councilmen, along with the, the uh, regular ordinary citizens. So I just go to show how far we've come as a nation. And, and I definitely wanted to make sure for that um, that's a quote from Obama, nonviolent change is possible. Love and hope can conquer hate. And that, that is the bottom line, you know, we, we, we know that that uh, the the darkness of hate can only be conquered by the the light of, of love. So, hmm. so uh, I, I again, I, I was just really really pleased to be able to to uh, to share my my vision and be able to commemorate the 50th anniversary and and this of the bus boycott of the 60th anniversary of the bus boycott and the 50th anniversary of the uh, Cro Selma to Mon Selma to Montgomery Cross March. And and we had President Bush there too. As you said, America yes. was there yes. in so many ways. And, and it reminds us that uh, justice is, is, is not a partisan issue. Um, right, and, 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 and to, to talk about one of the things you mentioned earlier is this is so incredibly gratifying to me to see that as opposed to the 60s, there were uh, all kinds of people, people from all walks of life and, and all creeds. But what we're seeing today is, I, I, you know, in the kind of marching that we're seeing now, I've just been astounded by scenes of people having a Black Lives Matter march in North Dakota uh -huh. or in Japan. <laughs> you know, so it's like the, the, uh, the movement that was started in Montgomery, the nonviolent protests that started in Montgomery has now made its way around the globe. And, and I, I think we can't, we can't overlook that and, and we should not minimize the impact. 
of where we are today and seeing the change and it, and it kind of reverberates, you know, in, in this, in the span of history, um, that's the, the, the gap between the Selma and Montgomery March and the bus boycott and the George Floyd, uh, demonstrations, it's not going to be that big in, the, in, in history when they look back at the history. It, it's been a long time to us, but I saw all this happen in my lifetime. And, and so it, it's just a blink of an eye when you look at it in time in a historical context. Right. So I think we have time for a few questions or a few final comments. All of you have added such profound insight to our understanding of history, to our understanding of how art is a way to document and connect to history and especially to connect to where we are today, where we are as a country and the way uh, that we are looking to our future. And, and as you said, still working to form a more perfect union. Um, do, would any of you like to comment any further on what, what is needed today and what you find um, hopeful, as you said, these protests all around the world, anything else that seems promising or that we need to have our mind on in terms of actions? I would, I would encourage all of everyone um, that if you need inspiration um, and as, you, as we are, have heavy hearts today, mourning the, the, the transitioning of Congressman Lewis and Reverend C.T. Vivian, um, I would say check out the, the film, Don Porter's film. Um, it is so inspiring. And, I, and I've, I've been working in this field for over 20 years. Um, and, you know, after that length of time, you, you just think that, you know, I've heard all the stories. I know, I, I, you know, I know a lot about this history. And you watch her film, you watch the Magnolia Pictures film. And I, and I was watching it at night, um, late at night after work. Um, and... I was so inspired. I was like, I, really, I want to go march now. Let's go march. Yeah. I want to get my family out of the bed at, at 11 o'clock and let's go, <laughs> let's go find a cause. Let's go do something. You just really understand the power of the person, of each person that we have within us. If we will, we will harness that. If we will um, let us, let us grab, gravitate to the legacy of Congressman Lewis and others like him who, and Dr. King and Mrs. Parks and, and all the Freedom Riders, let us gravitate to them and to their legacy and harness that to make us, to inspire us to be that change that we wanna see. Um, I think if we do that, if we, if we teach our young people, they have it in them. So many of these folks were so young. Freedom Riders were so young. Our youngest Freedom Rider was 13 years old. They have it in them to make the change. Um, and they are doing it. Let's be. Let's let's just let them do it. Let's they're energized. Let's let's let them lead. Well, and and Dorothy, you know, I'm reminded that you're really the reason we're having this program. Uh, Dorothy said, I, "I've got an idea." I was taking some pictures of art, such as we've been looking at today for the museum. And she said, "Let's let's let's deepen this conversation a little bit and live more deeply." into our history so that we better understand our present. And, and so thank you and, and all of the ways that um, we are needing to organize at the moment. So thank you um, for reminding us how we can connect to history and become inspired to create a better future and especially for inspiring us to do that here today. Um, Madeline or Bill, anything you wanna add? I don't see any questions coming in from the audience. Um, but if you guys see any, please add them or any final comments. Sure. Um, one thing that has been on my mind with John Lewis's passing is, you know, he said that we need to find a way to get in the way. And I think I'm very hopeful because I see a lot of that happening right now. Um, a lot of people who are around my generation, you know, and younger even, we're definitely getting in the way. And um, I think that that is so important to do and that is what Rosa Parks wanted as well was she so strongly believed in educating the younger kids so that they would have that sense of justice instilled in them and I think it's really wonderful that 
like not to brag on my generation too much, but you know, we've kind of, we've grown up with a lot of that, um, you know, in our schools and our education system wasn't perfect, but we do have that instilled in us. And so we want to speak out. We want to make that good trouble um, if we can. And that to me, and you know, John Lewis said that Rosa Parks was the person who got in the way and she made good trouble. And so just to come full circle with that, I definitely think we need to stay in the way. <laughs> right. Stay so from 13 on up. Yeah. Or younger. Even yeah. younger. Cheyenne <laughs> yeah. Christberg was nine years old. Yeah. Cheyenne Christberg was nine years old. Yeah. And, and people who were in the Children's March in Birmingham. I, I, I just want to, uh, I just want to challenge everybody who's watching and listening in today. If you harbor any kind of discrimination in your heart or your attitude eliminated today. I don't care if it's sexism, racism, uh, genderism, or styleism, whatever, eliminate all that. Because we are, there's only one race in this world. I, I wish we would get rid of that term. There's only one race as far as we know, and it's the human race. And so we're all much more alike than we are different. So stop discriminating for any reason. Uh, and most of the uh, most of the people that we've highlighted today, they discriminated against no one because as a young child, I understood that if I don't want anybody to discriminate against me for the color of my skin, I should not discriminate against anybody for any reason. And so that's always been my, my mantra and, and the, the standard that I live by. And I would appeal to everybody. As Madeline said, this generation now is uh, they're, be, they're to be applauded because they, they are more woke. And um, that old musical, The age, Dawning of the Age of Aquarius, we are in the age of Aquarius and people have become more enlightened and the eyes have been opened. So uh, keep up the good work, Generation X and the millennials and all you young people because the world needs it. The world really does need it. Absolutely. Right. And let us, but let us not forget those who have paved the way Absolutely. I've laid the foundation Absolutely. For, for today. And Alice, thank you for bringing all of us together. Um, this was such yes. a, it, we had no idea when we were planning this, you know, weeks ago that we would end up together today on, on, on today when we are more in the passing to giants. So thank you guys at, at Alum Shakespeare Festival and at Montgomery Museum of Fine Arts for all the work that you do to, to impact our communities. It is, it, I think, um, I think it's just so impactful the work that you guys do. So thank you for bringing us together on this day. Well, it's interesting um, because of course, Red Blunt who gave the land that the Shakespeare Festival and the museum is on and his, his house and the theater and um, to our art collection advocated for protection of the Freedom Riders, um, bringing all things together and I just can't thank you all enough for participating. We have a question about whether this will be archived. We should be able to watch this video on Facebook and eventually should have this video captioned. Um, so if there's anywhere we had any audio trouble or um, people otherwise would enjoy having the captions, we should have that eventually as well. So thanks to everyone who joined us today. Uh, thanks to our panelists, and I'd also like to thank my husband, David Carter, who always teaches me about the civil rights movement. It is his field of study as a historian and who helped get our tech set up today, too. So thank you. Everyone have a wonderful day. Thank you for joining the museum. I look forward to being able to talk to you all and see you all at the museum when that is possible. Yes. Thank you, Alice. Be safe, thank you. everybody. Wear your mask. Thank you. Get in the way. Get in the way. Get in the way yeah. and wear your mask. Alan has a good Black Lives Matter mask. I think we can probably get those at the Rosa Parks Museum too. Yeah. You can't? Well, I can tell you where to get them though. RebelSoulCollective.com, I think is where I got mine. Okay. Okay. I like yours too, Bill. Ciao. All right.